I'm just really happy to be here and to talk with you about God's Word today. And I just first want to say thank you for allowing me to do that. And before we get started, I just want to say a quick word of prayer. So please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, first off, I just want to say thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for your creation. Thank you for everyone in this, in this sanctuary today. Lord, I just ask that you give me the words to say. I can't do it on my own. It's your Holy Spirit that empowers us to do good works for you. And Lord, I just ask that you bring your Holy Spirit, your presence into this place today. And that we can learn more about you. We can worship you. And we can show our love for you here and in our daily lives. Lord, I just ask that you are here with us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, you can go ahead and go to the first slide. So, if you don't know what that is, the Hulk, right? <laughs> you might be wondering, why in the world would I start a sermon with a picture of the Hulk? I mean, it's, it's, he's popular in our popular culture right now, obviously a fictional character. But if you know anything about the Hulk, the Hulk is, you know, in the, his regular story, he's just mild-mannered scientist, calm guy. But something happened, an accident happened to him, so when he gets angry, he turns into, well, that. He turns into a monster. He gets so angry, he just, I mean, the saying is Hulk smash. He gets angry and he just smashes things and causes chaos. And the reason why I put that up there to start this sermon is because I feel like there are way too many Hulks in our world today, in our country today. And maybe they don't actually turn into green monsters and cause havoc in cities or whatever. But anger seems to be all over our world, is, is it not? Anger and hatred. It's a part of the human condition, but it's especially true, in my opinion, in today's world. You know, as he said before, uh, when he introduced me, I work in news talk radio. If you listen to the news, if you listen to talk radio or any, any news on TV, radio, I don't have to tell you how much anger and hatred is in the world today. I see it. I hear it. Every day. And it's funny, there are so many things when I talk about what's in the news. Where you try to come up with solutions to problems in the world. And it's, it's amazing how many times the solution is Jesus. It's amazing how many times the solution in the world and in our country today is right here in the Bible. It's the Son of God, Jesus. It is so obvious in my daily life that we all need a Savior. We need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. Amen. You can go to the next slide. So today I want to talk about being a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? How should a Christian act, a follower of Christ, in an angry and hateful world? Now, it's not an accident that I put that picture <laughs> when he's punching through a computer because that's where a lot of the anger and hatred is today, frankly. <laughs> if you go on social media, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, online in general, that's where the anger and hatred is. There's some times where I wanted to do that, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But I want to talk about today because the world, the world is like that. That's what the world is like. But we are not called to be like the rest of the world. So I want to talk today about what Christians, how Christians should act in a world that is like that, angry and hateful. And Jesus gives us the answer. And I'm going to go through some verses today that I'm sure most of you have probably heard. Most of you have probably seen. They're common. But even though they're common, I wonder how many people really listen to it? How many people really know it? How many people really live it and understand it? 
Or do they just have it in the back of their minds and they go to the rest of their lives and they, and they don't act like that? So the first, the first verse I'm going to read today is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. It's a common thing, you hear it all the time, but I want to go deep into it because it's important. It is the answer to what is going on in the world today. Uh, this is Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. And the whole purpose on the Sermon on the Mount was to instruct the disciples, instruct his followers, how to live in the kingdom of heaven, how to live in this world. This is what Jesus said to them. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. I, I don't have to tell you, when Jesus said this, it was radical and revolutionary. It really was. And frankly, in today's world, it's radical and revolutionary. This is not how the world expects us to act. I mean, if, if you just have to look in, the daily, in your daily life. I guarantee you, if you go up and slap someone in the cheek, they're not, most likely, nine times out of ten, they're not going to turn the other cheek. Even if they're Christians, frankly, they're not going to turn the other cheek. Now, when Jesus says an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, He's referencing Leviticus, the law in Leviticus. It comes from chapter 24 in Leviticus, where uh, Jesus said, anyone who ta takes the life of a human being is put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution for the life. Anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That was the law that the disciples, that the Jews, that Jesus were speaking to at that time knew. That was the law they knew. Oh, what do you mean not an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? That's what we were told in your law. Well, first off, when that law was put forward, it was a justice system. It was meant to be a justice system for the community, a, a fair legal system, so that there was fair punishment for those who did wrong. But what was happening is people were taking it from the justice system, and they were doing it individually. They were doing it in their personal lives. They were doing it out of personal revenge. So when someone would hit them on the cheek or something, or someone would do bad, they immediately would think they have to do it back. And Jesus was saying, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. Now, I just wanted to point out that when Jesus said this, this isn't a verse, this isn't a passage about, it's not necessarily about self-defense or about war or anything like that. When someone hits you on the cheek, it stings a little bit. There's no doubt about that. But it, it, won't, it won't kill you. It, it stings. And what happens is, and Jesus goes really far here, the whole purpose of him saying this is he wants us to give everything to God, everything to Jesus, everything to to him when you when someone does something to you in anger it doesn't have to be hitting you on the cheek it can be anything when someone does something to you in anger when someone does something to you in hatred and you respond in hatred and you respond in anger you're giving that person and frankly the devil but you're giving that person power over you you are giving that person power over how you act and how you feel, and how you live. And what Jesus was saying here is he was saying, this isn't about, I don't want you to give power over to anything in this world. Because you are called to live in righteousness. You are called to depend on God. So if you want justice in the world, 
You are called to depend on him. And God and Jesus calls us to forgive. Jesus calls us to live in righteousness. Jesus calls us to be good to our neighbor. Not to respond in anger and hatred. The world wants us to respond in anger and hatred. But Jesus said, no, no. We've, give that to me. Give all of that to me. Give your burdens to me. I want you to live for me with love and kindness. So in the next, in the next verse I have, Jesus also said, and this is really shortly after what I just read to you. And this is another thing that's pretty much revolutionary. It really is. People don't live this way in this, in this world. So next I want to talk about how we respond to hatred. And like, and like I said, this, it's no coincidence that Jesus said this shortly after he said the verse I just read to you. It's from Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. He says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Once again, this is a radical and revolutionary concept. Not even just then, but in today's world. I mean, it especially was then, because the people Jesus... Was, were talk, was talking to back then. They, um, you know, they were oppressed by the Romans. They were treated poorly by, you know, a reference tax collectors. They were treated poorly a lot of times by the religious leaders at the time. And the people were following Jesus. They wanted, they were expecting the Messiah to be this, um, I don't know, conqueror, warlike leader who would come and he would crush the Roman enemies. He would hate them and crush them and the tax collectors and he would bring revolution and change the government and the state. And Jesus is saying, and they're expecting that, and Jesus is saying, this? Jesus is saying, no, no, no. What I want you to do, actually, is not to continue to hate your enemies, but to love them. Wait, 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 wait. wait. We're supposed to love our enemies? Jesus said, yeah, yes. And what's interesting is he also says, you know, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. He wants us to be like Jesus. He wants us to be like him, to follow his example. If Jesus can love me as much as a sinner as I am, if Jesus can love us, a people who constantly reject him. I think we can love our enemies. Now, I just I just wanted to say when people when people see this, they kind of come up with their own definitions of love. You know, what what is what is love? You know, when I when I uh when someone does something bad to me and I go and punch them in the face, I'm doing it out of love, right? That's, that's what they'll say, you know? They'll kind of come up with their own definitions of love. Yeah, he said, he, he said love our enemies, but when, I, when I'm um, cussing at that person and treating him poorly, I'm doing it out of love. That's love, right? Tough love, yes. And they come up with their own definitions. What always makes me laugh about that is they forget that love is defined in the Bible. What love is, is actually, we're told what it means. So when Jesus calls you to love others, love your neighbor as yourself, when Jesus tells you to love your enemies, the Bible gives us instruction on how to do that. 
He didn't just say, okay, love, and figure out what love means. No, he, he says specifically exactly what love means. And um, in, the next, in the next verse, I put up that definition. Now it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4, verse 7. Now I just wanted to point out, this is a letter from Paul to the church at Corinth. And if you know anything about the church at Corinth at the time Paul was writing these, the letters to them, they were incredibly divided. They had a lot of problems. They, I mean, not just with, say, sexual immorality, but there was divisions. Oh, we're going to follow this person. No, we're going to follow this person. It was, it was a problematic church. That's why Paul was writing to them. Because they were not showing what love is. They were hating their enemies. And they were not showing how Christians should act in the world. And Paul was frankly straightening them out. So as a part of that, and I would encourage anyone to read the whole book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians when you get a chance. Because it's really timely. But this part, it it especially means something when you understand the context of what that church was going through. Because the people at the time needed to hear it. And frankly, I think we need to hear it today. Because I don't see this enough in the world. And frankly, I don't see it enough in some Christians. Christians don't always act like this. Here's the verses from Paul. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You know, it's funny, the one that that I go to first, the one that really always sticks out to me, is... The first part, love is patient. I struggle with patience sometimes. I can be a pretty impatient person. But I think uh, no doubt that in our daily lives we struggle with this when we try to love others, including our enemies. You know, I brought up earlier, I had the picture of the guy in the computer smashing through the computer. I don't know, any of you are on social media, Facebook or Twitter, Patience is not something that exists on there. It doesn't. People don't know how to be patient with one another. You're going to agree with me now, or you're an idiot. You're going to agree with me now, or yada, yada, yada. You're going to agree with me now, or... And then it goes to name-calling. And frankly, sometimes in the world, in our country, it gets violent. It just, it just does. And Jesus was saying, all those people that you disagree with, even on social media, all those people you disagree with in your daily life, all those people you have these arguments for us, you know you're supposed to love them, right? You're supposed to love them, even your enemies. <laughs> you're supposed to love them. And yet, we don't. And what love means, he says here, love is patient. No, we're not patient a lot of times with other people, even as Christians, unfortunately. And I'm not saying I'm perfect in this. I don't think any of us are perfect in this. Love is kind. Oh, no. I've seen some of the nasty things said about each other out there. It's not always kind, really. I understand we all have people we don't like, but you're supposed to be kind even to them. How else are you going to bring them to the gospel? How else are you going to bring them to Jesus if you're not kind? Love, it does not envy. Our envy is everywhere. Half of the arguments are because we're envious of someone else. Either how smart they are or what they have. And frankly, that's one of the other problems with social media. Everyone puts their best pictures on there. And everyone gets envious of everyone. Oh, man, look how great their life is compared to mine. We're so envious of them. 
You're supposed to rely on God, not on what other people think your life should be. It does not boast. It is not proud. Pride is everywhere in today's world, is it not? It's everywhere. Remember I was saying before, I am right. How many times do you hear that? You're wrong. I am right. No matter what you say. And I'm right because, you know, I know I'm so intelligent. I'm so much smarter than you. Whatever it is. And Jesus and Paul here are saying, um, no, that's not how you're supposed to be. In fact, you're nothing compared to God. Remember that? True wisdom comes from fearing the Lord. It is not self-seeking. Half of the arguments we hear in today's world are self-seeking to make ourselves look good. Jesus is saying you're supposed to love others and not be self-seeking. You're supposed to love them. Not only are you supposed to love them, you're supposed to love them for their sake. You're supposed to love them to help them. It is not easily angered. Well, we just went over that with the Hulk, right? Everything is, everything is easily, everybody is easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. How many times do we get in arguments with other people? And we remember. We remember what they said. We remember what they did to us. We remember. We don't forget. And then that comes back. And Jesus and Paul says, um, you're actually not supposed to keep a record. You're supposed to forgive them. You're supposed to love and forgive them. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. These words, right there. We have no excuse now. We, we have no excuse, is basically what I'm saying here. When we don't treat others with love, and remember what I said before this, we're supposed to treat our enemies with love. We don't treat others with love, including our enemies. We have no excuse because it's, it's laid out for us how exactly we're supposed to act. So I wanted to, uh, we know how we're supposed to act in an angry and hateful world. We know we're supposed to forgive, turn the other cheek, not lash out in anger. We're supposed to love our friends and our enemies. Now, the next verse I'm going to read might seem a little contradictory to everything I just, I, I just read. It's not. But I want to go through it because it's important. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39. This is Jesus once again. Not too, much, not too much longer after he was telling them how to live, loving their enemies, turning the other cheek. But he also said this. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mo her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. You might say, I thought he came to bring division in the sword. I thought, I thought he came to unite us all. I thought that's what you were just saying, Mike. The reason why Jesus was saying this is because, yes, Jesus called us to turn the other cheek. Yes, Jesus called us to love. And that's patience, kindness, everything I just pointed out. But what Jesus did not call us to do is to give up the truth. The truth of the gospel. That's what Jesus is saying here. When he's saying, I'm bringing the sword, I'm going to separate mother and daughter for other 
against brother, whatever it may be. He's saying that's going to happen because when you bring the truth of the gospel to the world, including loving your enemies, that's part of the truth of the gospel, loving your enemies, the world doesn't want to hear it a lot of the time. The world doesn't want to hear love your enemies. And when he's saying when you bring that truth to the world, when you set yourself apart, which is what holy means, it means to set apart, you're going to get people that hate you. You're going to get people that are angry at you. They're not going to like what you say. And, he, and what he's saying here is, just because I want you to love, just because I want you to be kind and everything, doesn't mean I want you to give up the truth. doesn't mean I want you to give up your faith. You are still called to follow me and follow my example. But we're told, so how do we reconcile these two is, I guess, the point I want to get to. So we're called to love our enemies. We're called to turn the other cheek, but we're also called to fight for the truth. So, so how do we reconcile these two? And this is hard for a lot of people in the world. And frankly, it's been hard for Christians since the beginning of the church. If, you, if anyone reads the history of the church, the church did, definitely did not get this right all the time. They definitely did not. So actually, this is another example where it's, we're told exactly how to reconcile these two things. How to love our enemies, but to also fight for the truth. And it comes from, it comes from the next verse I'm going to read. And once again, it's from Paul, and this time he's talking to the Roman church. It's from Romans chapter 12, verse 14 through 21. He tells us exactly how we fight for the truth. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing. There's that pride, proud word again, by the way. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And here's really where he gets to the solution. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. Remember, turn the other cheek. He's saying that here again. Do not take revenge. But leave room for God's wrath. Remember I said before, we are supposed to give everything to God, depend on him, not take it upon ourselves to fix to take revenge, but that's up to God. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And then Paul gets pretty radical here again, similar to turn the other cheek. He says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What Paul is saying here, and this is how you reconcile those two things. Jesus doesn't want us to give up our faith. He doesn't want us to give up the truth. He doesn't want us to deny our faith for the sake of you know, peace and harmony. What he does want us to do is fight for the truth, but he wants us to do it with good. He wants us to do it with love. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but fight evil with good. Imagine how much better this world would be if every time there was anger or hatred towards one another, we um, forgave them. Imagine how much better the world would be if we acted like that. You go over that one verse again. Yeah, I think it's important. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Oh man, imagine that. Your enemy out there, someone you really don't like, going through a hard time. The way we act in this world, we would be like, Aha! You deserve it! But, but Paul is saying, no. Actually, what I want you to do is the opposite of that. I want you to feed him. Not only to love him, forgive him, but then actually feed him. Your enemy. He says, well, your enemy, not just your friend. 
If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. You will convict him of the truth if you live like Christ did. Because that's, that's how Christ lived. There was Even the religious leaders at the time of Jesus couldn't understand what Jesus was doing. He was talking to the sinners, the tax collectors. He was going to their house, going to their parties, loving them. He was healing the blind. People who didn't necessarily love him back. And that's what Jesus was doing. And the, the religious leaders at the time are like, what are you doing? How dare you do this? And Jesus says, we're supposed to love them. That is how we are called to be. Imagine how, just imagine how much better the world would be if we acted like that. Remember I started at the beginning? I was like, it's amazing how so many problems in the world that I deal with on a daily basis would be solved by Christ, by Jesus. It's so true. It's so true. So, I have some bad news and some good news when it comes to all this. The bad news, it's not easy. Nothing I said so far is easy. Easy is not... (laughs) When Jesus came and saved us, he rewards us with a lot. He does not reward reward us with an easy life. That's not... That's not there. It's just not. He doesn't say, when you, when you receive the gospel, everything's going to go great. It'll be so easy. It'll be a breeze. No problem. If anyone believes that, they haven't read Paul's words when he talks about how much he was persecuted for the truth. His persecutions are way more than anything I've ever had to face. And frankly, when you read the history of the church, that's true as well. People expected, actually, at the beginning of the church, people expected to be killed for their faith. It's not easy. Nothing I said is easy. The good news is, you don't have to do it on your own. That's the good news. You do not have to do this on your own. Because we have the creator of the universe on our side, We have the Holy Spirit on our side to empower us. The next verse I'm going to read, the next passage I'm going to read, is from John chapter 14, 25 through 27. And Jesus talked about this. He said, All of this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You just told me to love my enemies. You just told me to turn the other cheek in an an angry and hateful world, and now you're telling me not to be afraid? I'm a little scared. Wouldn't anybody be? Especially since Jesus at the time was going up to the Father. And he says, don't worry, don't worry. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, it's going to be difficult. Yes, there's going to be divisions. And even death. But I am going to help you. I am going to empower you. And I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the advocate. What he says there. The Holy Spirit will come down and empower you to get through it. You know, I've used this example a lot, but I think it's, it's really good. A lot of times when we're facing challenges, it seems like, you know, that first picture I put, the Hulk, the Hulk, you know, we're dealing with our enemies. When we're dealing with challenges in our life, it seems like we're, deal, we're up against the Hulk. I can't beat the Hulk. He's big, strong, powerful. That's what it feels like to us a lot of times. Do you not realize as big as any of your challenges are, that God is bigger, that you have the creator. I think we forget this sometimes. 
You have the creator of the universe on your side. When we talk about the Holy Spirit empowering you, that is God. That is part of the Trinity. That is the creator of the universe empowering you. You're telling me that the creator of the universe can't take on the Hulk? You're telling me the creator of the universe can't deal with some of the struggles in your life? You're telling me the creator of the universe can't help you love your enemy? Of course he can. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, and I said this before. When you follow these instructions, it will not be easy. You will endure hardship. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. You probably have struggle, pain. And like I said before, you could even be killed for it. In fact, some are saying that more Christians in the world, luckily not here, thankfully not here, that there are more Christians in the world being killed now for their faith than ever before. And it's not going to be easy. But God is with us. A good example of how it's not easy is, and I'm not going to read the whole verse right now, but in Acts it talks about Stephen. Stephen was a man who was preaching the gospel. And he was preaching to the religious leaders. The religious re- leaders brought him and they you know, basically told him to denounce his, you know, what he was saying. And Stephen, and it's an act, so I'd encourage you to read it, but Stephen does a very long sermon. He basically calls out the religious leaders at the time and says, you're wrong. And what did they do to him? They didn't say, well, oh, okay, everything's all good. No. They killed him for it. They stoned him for it. In fact, Paul, who was at the time Saul, was one of the people that stoned him. Or at least he was there saying it was okay to do. But what happens after that? Stephen looks towards heaven, and he knows that God is with him. And he knows that even in death, he's still saved. Because Jesus conquered death. Another verse I want to read for you real quick. This comes from Titus, chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. At one time you were too foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want to stress you stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Basically sums it up right there. That before we lived in a hateful and angry world, we still do, but we were a part of it before. We reacted in hate. We reacted in anger, in envy, or whatever. But then we were given the gift of the hope and the goodness of our Lord and Savior. And in that, not only are we empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus to get through it, but we have been justified by his grace that we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. So no matter what we go through in our lives, No matter how much anger and hatred we face on a daily basis, we still have hope. We have hope in the Holy Spirit being here with us now, and we have hope in eternal life, 
the resurrection. And that was proved when Jesus conquered death himself and rose from the dead himself. What greater hope is there than that? Sure, slap me on the cheek. I have eternal life. Slap me on the cheek all you want. You can hate me all you want. I have eternal life. You can't beat that. I want to end by reading uh, Paul once again in 1 Corinthians. He says this. This is 1 Corinthians, and I don't have, fortunately, yeah, I don't have it up there, but this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 15. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with, the, with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my, bro my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Would you pre please uh, pray with me? Dear Lord, I want to thank you so much for what you did for us. I know that we all deal with struggles and hardships and anger and hatred in this world, and you never promised us otherwise. But I want you to remind us this week including myself, that you empowered us with the Holy Spirit to get through it and that we have the hope in eternal life that no one else can have any real power over us except you who conquered death. Thank you so much, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Um, I believe now uh, we just take a few minutes and if anyone has, we play some music and any, if anyone has any prayers to give to the Lord, you can do that for just a couple of minutes and then we'll uh, uh, do the benediction.